Welcome to Gospel Project as we spend another week looking at the book of Acts at the early church. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Acts chapter 4. We'll be at the end of the chapter going into chapter 5, looking at a story that uh, is somewhat shaking to see as we see the holiness of God and how serious he takes it with Ananias and Sapphira. And oftentimes that story begins at chapter 5 and you get stuck with the division there, but you don't realize that the context for it goes all the way back into chapter 4. And so it'll be helpful for us to spend these few moments reading from Acts chapter 4, the end of the chapter, all the way into chapter 5, looking at these two stories. And, you know, as we look at it, there, there's a sense at which God cares about His holiness and about His church and how we interact with one another. The main idea of the lesson this week is God calls on the church, His son's bride, to practice heartfelt generosity, that's what we're called to do, and to live reverently before Him. He cares about His holiness. Even you could say fearfully before Him. There's a sense of awe we should have before God. And so uh, that's, that's kind of how we'll end the passage. But to give context, we really need to look at this idea of living generously. And in particular, uh, we're going to see uh, hypocrisy at its best in this story. You know, hypocrisy is a is something we most times think of other people. You think, he's a hypocrite. But our hearts have a tendency sometimes to lean into hypocrisy. They are a, uh, what we're trying to do is to put off a sense of holiness about yourself. And the bad part is, it's, it's a false holiness. You, you want people to see something about you that you don't actually have. You know, over the uh, years, the past few years, I've been a part of several groups um, in which daily I post my scripture reading. So when I have my quiet time, I maybe read two, three, four, five chapters in a day. And so I'm reading those when I'm done I would post uh, what I had read. Now, I'd reached a point one time when I sat down, I thought, why do I wait till I'm done? I'm sitting here looking at it. Let me just go ahead and post it. So I would post on the front end before I had read it. I was going to read it anyway. Well, if you have little kids or life, uh, it all comes at you at a, in a fast pace. You have, a, there are times when you're trying to read your Bible and the day gets wrecked, you get a phone call, or something comes up and you, you struggle to finish what you are actually reading. And on a few different occasions, in full honesty, I would have posted something that I read, but then actually not, not been able to finish it. There would have been an interruption or something come along. And I got to, to think it, I think it happened to me two or three times, and I, I, got, I got done and I thought, you know what, that's, that's hypocrisy. I've now stated some form of godliness or holiness that I actually don't have. I've said I'm going to read something that I actually didn't read. And the, the same thing's true of these darker moments where you're walking around and living your life and you know that you aren't as holy, but around other people, you start to put on a show. You start to make want to make people think that you're more holy than you actually are. That's hypocrisy. It's a lie to those you're around. And that's what we'll really see here in this passage with Ananias and Sapphira. But we have to get context for that. So let's look at um, back into chapter 4. I want to just walk you through it. The first point of the lesson is that God's people are to live generously. Before we can look at Ananias and Sapphira, we, got to, we, have, we need to see how the church is to be generous with one another. So look with me in Acts 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. So here's all these people that have just been converted here in the book of Acts. And now they have this unified body of believers. And the way it shows up, the way you see unity in the body is this. Look what it says. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So here they are as a new body of believers, even you might say a family, 
sharing everything in common. It's the same way that you might think of your family, your house, with myself and my wife and my kids. We don't walk around going, well, you know, we sit down at the dinner table and we each pull from the same plate. But when we sit down at the table and everything's there in the middle, it's all our food. It's not, well, hey, I worked my job today, that's my food. No, 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 it's our food, it's our family's food. Because as family, you share everything in common. The rooms, the carpet, the house, the stairs, everything in the house, it's, it's yours together. That's the same idea here. It's just, as a body of believers, we share things in common. There's this generosity the Bible calls for from Christians to other Christians. Now, um, just uh, look at verse 33. We'll look at a couple more verses. And with great power, the apostles were giving te their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, they sold them. They brought the proceeds that was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And so here they're bringing the uh, excess they have. They have a, a piece of land, and so remember that in a moment. Everything they're selling is excess. It's not that they're giving of their own food. The ones that had extra, the ones that had these extra items, they sold so that they could give to the whole. It all came to the church. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and then the apostles were able to distribute it to those who were in need. Now, ju just remember, I just want to point out a few things here. Uh, first of all, the, the church is the primary means in which our generosity should show up. I know oftentimes we talk a lot about, as Christians, we're giving people. And so we, we just naturally think that we should be generous to everybody on the planet. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. Here's what I am saying, though. The obligation you have to give of your stuff is higher within the family of God than it is outside of the church. There is an obligation I have that if my son is in a place and he needs food and there's somebody else's child in a, the same place and they need food, I have an obligation to my child first. I, I am responsible to him and feeding him which sometimes can be costly. But for us, we are responsible to each other. That, that's part of the church. So you shouldn't feel obligated for every person who's poor. You should look within the church and say, I'm going to take care of who is poor within the church. That's where our generosity comes. The other interesting thing that happens here is the church becomes a hub for this to happen. N notice they bring it to the apostles' feet. The apostles then distribute it to those who have need. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. You can go read it sometime later, just pause it now and look at it. But in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, th there's a passage that talks about those who are taking advantage of this. They're lazy, they're not doing anything, they're not really um, showing any fruit of being Christians, but they're in the church, they're idle, and they're taking of uh, people's generosity. And the Bible actually calls for the church there, uh, Thessalonica, to discipline them and to stop giving to them. In other words, they're not part of your group. So church discipline came upon this group because they were taking advantage of the generosity of the church. Here's what I'm saying, is that by bringing it to the main church, that made sure that the money that was being given wasn't taken advantage of. You weren't giving to somebody that was going around and lying and uh, taking advantage of lots of people. Uh, sometimes that happens. Uh, there'll be people come through and they have the best story ever. It's not true. It, it, it pricks people's hearts and they go from church to church to people to people asking for stuff. And that's really what they're doing. They're just taking advantage of people. Uh, but, but oftentimes we can pretty well within the church be able to spot that kind of stuff. So that's where the church is helpful to you to guard and make sure you're giving to the true body of believers. So the church was the hub. We, we're warned against uh, being careful about being taken advantage of. But as Christians, this is the whole point here, we're called to be generous to those 
other believers in the church. Now let's flip over here because uh, there is an example. What, what uh, Luke's going to do here, he's going to give an example of a good uh, person doing this and a person, and then Ananias and Sapphira who don't do it well. So here's the second point, and then we'll read it. Uh, God's people are to live honestly. So here's the positive example here. Uh, look at verse 36. Thus Joseph, who was also called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus. So, so Barnabas does this right. Look what he does. He sold a field that belonged to him. He brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, it's the same thing Ananias and Sapphira are going to do. They're going to sell a field and they bring money and lay it at the, the apostles' feet. So the action is going to be the same, uh, but there's a slight tweak that we're going to see in the next chapter. Now, verse 1 of chapter 5, notice what Ananias and Sapphira did. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Same, same thing that uh, Barnabas or Joseph, as you call him here, would do. Verse 2, and his wife's knowledge, with his wife's knowledge, so they both knew this, Look what he did. He kept back for himself some of the proceeds and he brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want to help process chapter 5 for you because it's a little confusing um, what the sin that Ananias and Sapphira are committing. Like, what is it they're actually doing wrong? Uh, because at the end of the day, they're still giving to the church. It's strange, isn't it? That, that these aren't people that are persecuting Christians. These people aren't committing these heinous sins against other people. They're simply giving to the church. I mean, how can this be such a terrible thing that they're coming to the church and they're giving uh, something, some part of the land that they've sold? So here's, here's the difference. And this will be kind of, I'll build to the main point of what they did wrong. But here at core level, we see them lying. It's not true. Whereas Barnabas shows up and he says, here's my piece of land. And he sells the whole thing. And he says, here's all the money for it. But for him, these, these folks, Ananias and Sapphira, they sell it. And they're saying, here's all it cost while it actually they were paid more. So they're, they're putting off a false perspective here. They're lying. That's, that's part of hypocrisy. What you're doing is putting out a false front so that people think you are more holy than you actually are. You, we we got to be careful as Christians. I know sometimes you don't want the shame of people knowing that you're not quite the person you'd hope to be. But as Christians, that's, we live in the grace of God, and we all know that we're sinners, and we need to be honest sinners. And we don't need to try to put off some sort of fake front that's not real. So, so here they are. Joseph, Barnabas, is the good example. Sold the land, honest, gave it to the apostles, did it right. Ananias and Sapphira are the bad examples. So let's look at the third point. We'll spend quite a few moments in here. Look at the third one. God's people are to live reverently. And, and really, um, I want to point at just two phrases there in the text, and then I'll walk you through the story. The Bible gives us thematic statements. So the question you have to come off with is, what's the point of Ananias and Sapphira? Why is this? I'm going to tell you the point, then I'm going to come back to it at the end. But I'm going to show it to you in two verses. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, and when Ananias heard these things, he fell down, breathed his last, and look what happened. Great fear came upon all who heard it. Skip down to verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. What's the point of all of this? Is that we would live reverently and fearfully before a holy God. That's what, that's what God wanted. He wanted people who took his holiness as a serious matter and not something that they can fake. And they can come in and trick everybody to think they're somebody they're not. So that being said, we'll come back to it in a minute, but let's look at this story of Ananias and Sapphira, verse three. But, when, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back 
for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. So here's the problem, right? The, it, it, he kept back part of the, the money. So then you might would say, well, maybe his sin was the fact that if he, he should have, he was called to give all of it. And if he would have just given half of it, then, then he would have been okay. Uh, no, he, he actually, the sin wasn't that he gave only half. It was the deception. Look at verse 4. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? If you just didn't sell it, you'd have been fine, in other words. Look at this next phrase. And after it sold, was it not at your disposal? Okay, so you could just keep the money. He's not even worried about that. Here's what's the problem. Look at it. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. The problem is this deceptive, hypocritical lie that he's actually giving all of the proceeds from the land. He's wanting to create a perception of holiness that's not real. And there's even a little... Um, Holy, sometimes you say, how do you prove the Holy Spirit's God? Here's a good verse for it because it says you've not only lied to the Holy Spirit, but you've also lied to God. They're equated here in the text. Look at verse 5. though. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. So this dramatic scene, the guy comes in, lays his offering down, nobody knows any different. And then Peter just says, you've lied to God. And Peter doesn't pronounce the judgment. He just pronounces the sin. And in that moment, God places judgment on him. And then he falls over dead. I mean, literally falls over dead in the scene. Now, in this ironic, dramatic moment, Sapphira was not there with him. So before she comes to the church... Look what happens in verse 6. The young men rose, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. So, so they wrap him up. He's taken out of the room. But after an interval of about three hours, Sapphira comes wondering where Ananias is at. He can come home. She doesn't know what's happened. The Bible tells us. She doesn't know what's occurred here. Verse, verse 7. She doesn't know what's happened. She's looking for Ananias. Then verse 8. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. So there's the point. Did this land cost, did you sell it for $1,000? When she actually sold it for $2,000, right? Or something like that. He, he gives her a chance. So again, the, the problem here is this lying, this deception. She says yes for so much. And then Peter, in a dramatic statement, said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately, she fell down at his feet, and she breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who had heard these things. A couple of things to think about. First, do you think Ananias and Sapphira were believers? Some think they were because they were actually part of the church. I think it's possible. I think it's possible that Ananias and Sapphira were believers and they had a moment of sin publicly and in that moment God said, okay, you've disgraced me enough. I'm bringing you home. I also think it's possible they were not believers, and this was a clear marking to differentiate. Either you're going to be holy within the church or you're not. It, it, they were included among the church, but it's possible a person who's not genuinely converted is. It's an interesting question to think about. Either way, we do see the judgment of God placed on their lives with the purpose, as the text said, I told you a minute ago, that great fear would seize everyone around them. And what should they be afraid of? They should be afraid of putting up a false, hypocritical holiness about themselves. To try to claim some sort of godly character or, or act that they don't actually have. 
that they had sold all this land. And Peter's point was, you could have just kept the money. You didn't have to come and lie about it. So the question then begs, why did they even give it? Was it just purely a deceptive act so everybody would think that they were somehow more godly than they were? All that being said, we must be Christians and people that are genuine in our faith. And that means you have to be genuine about your sin. Don't try to act like you're somebody that you're not. And I'll point out one last thing in the text. Think about the apostle that's sitting here pronouncing this judgment. Peter. Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times. And after that third time, he wept and then Jesus pursued him again, called him to feed his sheep, and there was this restoration of Peter found there on that sh shore of the Sea of Galilee. But you have this picture of a man who also fell into sin, and by the grace of God, God restored him and used him for his glory. Can you imagine the grace that Peter understood while he looked at these two individuals that were falling in sin in front of him? Here's Here's the hope we have in Christ. We serve a gracious God who is willing to receive us in our honest, repentant, sinful state. Don't try to walk around with God acting like you have it all together because He knows just how broken and sinful you are. So stop faking it with everybody else. Be honest and genuine about your walk with Him and God has called us to fear Him and Him alone. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the grace You've extended to us. The fact that we still stand here breathing uh, this life of grace that You've given us. And Lord, we just pray You would help us to live genuine, authentic lives that, Lord, we are truly trying to follow You and use uh, just this story right here for us to have genuine fear of you and your holiness, understanding the grace you've extended to us in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.